Okay. Uh, I've been using this slide for a couple years now. I've been saying something big was coming. Something big came, and it was God's own. It wasn't what we were expecting, but it was a huge event and it affected all of us. What were some of the impacts that we saw this year? Well, we saw the novel uh, uh, virus. And if you look at the current numbers on here, we've had about 28 million cases worldwide. The latest figures as of yesterday, we had 192,000 deaths in the United States. The current estimates is by the end of December 31st, we're gonna have about 415, 425,000 deaths. If we extrapolate that out by the 1st of April, we're gonna have somewhere around 600,000 deaths. And by the 1st of May, we may have as many as 750,000 deaths in the United States alone. We had the fastest onset of a recession in US history. We had exploding unemployment, including me. On June the 11th at nine o'clock in the morning, I was a corporate microbiologist with 95 days to retire. I was counting the days down. Uh, at 9.30 that morning, I had zero days to retirement. I was one of 11 people walked out the door that particular day. Okay, now, um, about an hour and a half ago, we had these two individuals from the future that were talking about going with the flow. Uh, Duck Dodgers, I believe, was one of their names, and the other one was Dodgers Duck. I think they're twin brothers, but they have different parents. I don't understand that biology, but you know, I mean, whatever, I'm a microbiologist anyway. But these guys from the 24th and a half century talked about going with the flow. In my own particular case, it sounds like a horrible story, except the 36 hours after I got shown the door, I started getting home calls from home advisor on how to run swimming pools. Stop calling me people. I'm getting more work than I know what to do with. If I were gonna handle all the calls that I'm getting, I would have to hire four full-time people and buy five service vehicles. I'm busier now than I was on June the 10th. But I'm not floating, but I don't have that corporate BS behind me. And my blood pressure has dropped 15 points. Go with the flow sometimes. So Doc Dodgers and Dodgers Doc, we're actually right. You can't predict the future, just go with it. All right, and then on top of that, we've had all of these conflicting statements coming out of Washington and the states and counties and okay. We've got the highest levels of civil protest since the 1960s. It looks like one of the summers of 67 or 68 when the city's caught on fire. That's the way it looks to me. And how many people in here knew how to use Zoom before about the 1st of March. We've got a 15-year-old in the next room sitting right over there that's doing remote learning on Zoom and Google Meets and a couple of other applications. School districts down here in Georgia are all over this place. Nobody was doing it before. All right, but is this year really different? Well, I'm about two days away from turning 64. Let's look at the major biological events that have occurred just in my lifetime. And let's see if this year is really substantially different than some of those other big years. 1956, the year I was born, with an ongoing decades long outbreak of polio. That year there were 1,111 cases in the United States, 75% caused permanent paralysis, 36 deaths. Parents were terrified for decades, decades of that disease. 1968, Hong Kong flu. Now, this is not a political statement. That was what it was called at the time. And if you look it up, it will be referred to, that one's the H2N3 or the H3N2, I forget which one it is. And Hong Kong flu, a million deaths worldwide, 100,000 deaths in the United States. I was in middle school, 40%, 40% of the kids in my junior high were out sick along with 40% of the teachers. That was the sickest I ever saw my mother right up until the month that she died. That was a 
devastating influenza. 1976, Legionnaires, not that many cases, but it made nightly news on every network, all three of them at the time. You could find it with a terrorist attack. It was the, I'm terrified by that. 1981 to present, HIV, AIDS, 65 million deaths, 65 million infections, 25 million deaths worldwide. Ebola, West Africa, 28,000 infections, 11,000 deaths. These are just the major outbreaks in my lifetime. Let's take a longer look at history. Looking back a couple thousand years, in about 530, a plague started in the Mediterranean Basin. It lasted 200 years. It killed 100 million people in the Mediterranean and North African area. 1300s, Black Death. 60% of Europe died. Look at the colonization, the discovery of America. Between 1492 and 1600, 90 to 95% of the indigenous population of North America died from common diseases that were imported by Europeans settling into this continent and into the, this hemisphere. In 1846 through 1860, cholera pandemic killed a million Russians, 23,000 people in Great Britain, 10,000 in London. Spanish flu. That's what it was called. Okay, where did the Spanish flu originate? Kansas. I didn't name it, ladies and gentlemen. The Spanish flu originated in Kansas. But in 1918 to 1920, 50 million infections between 17 and 50 million deaths. So is 2020 really an exceptional year compared to historical outbreaks. Bottom line, this year is just another year of the microbial world doing what it normally does. A new bug has originated and we are very susceptible to it. It's just Okay. I've used this slide for the last couple of years. It explains a little bit. There's really about three roots of infections we worry about into the body. Contacts to skin. All right, you get wet. All right, these are pretty minor infections. Unless they go septicemic, you don't really worry about those. Gastrointestinal illnesses. They can be serious. If you've ever had norovirus, let's think about this. If you've ever had norovirus, you know it's a serious disease. Most of those plagues that we talked about in the past were airborne. Inhaled droplets going into the lungs, causing an infection. Those are the really bad ones. Black death in Europe in the Middle Ages in the 1300s was an airborne disease. It killed a lot of Europeans. Okay, so let's get into some physiology, and this is important to understand how um, we can control organisms in here. Um, growth rate has always followed similar patterns, and the limitation of growth rate, there's a couple of factors in here. How much nutrition they have, temperature is it at? Is the competition from another organism, waste accumulation. The pattern is unique for each species, but they are consistent given these parameters. And that's where a lot of the mathematical modelers have talked about the, the, the continuation and the pattern we're seeing um, of the number of cases. It's based on known patterns in the past, predictable inputs. We're going to go into that a little bit and we're going to explain why this can be controlled. All right, let's talk about, you know, if you're looking on Zoom and you know, look in here, it's frequent that you're going to see little dogs run through the background. A lot of us have dogs. We've got, we've got a dog here in the household. If we look at this right in here, 
can, uh, I think, I hope you can see my mouse moving in here on here, uh, but the puppy growth rate, the rate of growth depends upon the species of the dog. The bigger dogs hit maturity a little bit slower. The smaller dogs hit maturity much faster uh, in here. And the, you can see the, the slope of the line is how fast that dog hits maturity. So each type of dog has its own growth rate. This is a growth of trees. Three different species of trees. The general growth pattern of trees looks like the general growth pattern of dogs. Now, it's a longer time period, but it's still a similar shaped curve. Well, this is a little different growth pattern in here. Uh, that one there in the upper left hand corner is the growth rate of a bacteria. And you can see it starts off and it goes you know, very, very close to vertical. And then it grows up to a certain point and flattens out. That's at the end of the growth period. Now that curve right below it, right down there, and I don't know whether you can see my mouse on the screen or not, but it's like that. This little curve straight below it is the food supply. If you will notice, that once the food supply goes to zero, the growth stops. And that one to the left, to the right of it over in here, is what the bacteria is producing. And so this bacteria is growing. It is taking this thing in the lower left hand corner and it is making this material over in the right hand corner. It turns out. This is a page right out of my PhD dissertation. It is the bacterial physiology of an organism referred to as Zymomonas mobus. And what this organism is doing is it is growing and it is taking this stuff in the lower left hand corner called sugar, and it is making this material over in the lower right hand corner called alcohol. And this particular organism makes, is known for this compound that it produces and the compound that it produces, well, actually, it's the mixture that it produces, is known to you as the substance of tequila. And so, fundamentally speaking, the growth pattern of dogs, trees, and the bacteria that makes tequila follow the exact same principles. And in this particular case, the important thing to keep in mind is if you cut off the food supply in the lower left-hand corner, the growth stops. What does that mean for viruses like SARS-CoV-2? Well, this is the pattern of growth in the initial part of the outbreaks. It looks an awful lot like the other organisms that we talked about. They're a little flatter. They're a little flatter because we started doing human intervention. We started doing social distancing. We started doing wearing masks. We closed down businesses because we impacted the growth rate. What did we really do? We cut down the food supply so the virus wasn't able to replicate. This is a virus. It needs an energy source. It needs a food source. So what is the food that this virus utilizes? It is a species referred to as Homo sapiens. The food supply for this virus is humans. If you want to reduce the spread of this virus, you have to cut down the food supply. And you cut down the food supply by physical distancing, wearing masks, medical intervention, and vaccinations. Those are the tools that we have readily available. Okay, let's get into a little bit more on microbiology in here. And you know, we're not gonna get much deeper into that, but we really have some different categories of organisms we wanna talk about. We wanna talk about viruses. Uh, viruses are not living. They cannot reproduce on their own. 
they need a host. And there's multiple kinds of viruses on there, bacterial viruses. Now, these are the ones that I played with a little bit in graduate school. I don't like viruses. They are difficult to deal with. And I'm going to let other people deal with it that have more patience to deal with them than I do. I don't like them. Good. Uh, I've had friends who worked on plant viruses and animal viruses. I'm primarily worked on bacterial, bacteria, and fungi are what I've worked on. And there are more bacteria that are unknown that are known. And a very, 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 very limited number of them actually cause disease. Right. Fungi, you got two categories. You got the filamentous fungi, but those including the mushrooms that are growing out in the outside yard. We've had a lot of rain down here in Atlanta recently. And you've got the yeast, and those are the single celled organisms. In there. And you've got parasites. Those are the categories that we deal with in microbiology. All right. Now, what's all that mean? Well, now we want to control these organisms. All right. So, these are terminologies that we need to understand what they really mean in here. A pesticide, by legal definition, and I'm talking about in the United States and most countries follow the same definition, a pesticide is something that controls a pest. A pest is something that you don't want. That could be germs, it could be weeds in your yard, it could be fruit flies growing around your orchard, it could be armadillos. Whatever it is, it's a pest and so you use some sort of agent, whether it be physical or chemical, to control the pest. And there's different ways you can apply it, you can control it. You can use a biostat. Now, that doesn't kill it, it just renders it, stops it from growing or stops it from reproducing. Some of the biostats on insecticides, for instance, stop the larvae from going, from molting and going to the next stage. They never grow up, they never hit sexual maturity, and so the species dies out uh, because they never get the sexual maturity and they cannot reproduce. Then there are agents that kill. We call these biocides and categories in there. They're sterilants. They kill everything, including humans if you use them wrong. There's disinfectants and there's sanitizers. Now, in Europe, I'm going to warn you, in the United States, a disinfectant is a bigger term than sanitizer. In Europe, it's the other way around. So it depends on which side of the Atlantic Ocean you're on and whether you're on OECD or US EPA Canadian guidelines is what these terms mean in here. But in the United States, a disinfectant basically kills 100% of the vegetative cells. Most of what we're dealing with in the United States and Canada would be referred to as sanitizers. And sanitizers limit the number of pathogens on the surface. Then there's antiseptics that you don't scan and antibiotics. All right, biocides are terms that we use on non-living objects. Um, an example of a non-living object would be a float tank. An example of a living object, generally speaking, would be Graham and Ashcon. Maybe. Okay, how are you, what kind of mechanisms do we have? And so we can, Stop the host from, we can stop the agent from attaching to the host. That's really hard to do. Or we can destroy their integrity. And if we envision these things as a water balloon, we can use agents that poke little pins in there and they leak their cytoplasmic guts all over the place and they just kind of disintegrate into this big gelatinous blob. Destroy their cytoplasm. We can stop their enzymes, we can stop their RNA, we can stop their DNA. All these you can go into with microbiology, and believe me, there's classes that you can take in these things. But we have these options that we can study and we can pick the biocides from how they work to attack organisms in appropriate manners. And this is what my job has been for the last 30 years. All right. We're gonna focus on viruses for the next few minutes because this is the most important part uh, for all of our industry right now. Is that there's a different ways that you could do viruses on here. And it's like you RNA and DNA and single-stranded and enveloped and unenveloped. And it's like, who cares, right? Who cares? The thing that really matters for us for maintaining a healthy environment is how they are classified from a regulatory viewpoint because using regulatory 
we can classify and develop appropriate antimicrobials to enhance public health. All right. Said coronavirus is an enveloped virus. It's that one category. So it's got this coating around it. And then there's a group of these things. Coronaviruses and hepatitis C, herpes, hep B, influenza, parainfluenza, HIV. There's another group called large envelope. Another group called small envelope. Bottom line is, as you go down this list, they get much harder to control. Now, in theory, if you develop an antimicrobial that controls something like hepatitis A and rhinovirus, it's down there in the very difficult to control category. It's going to kill everything above it or inactivate it technically. But if you only develop a product that kills coronavirus, you're not going to expect it to kill rotavirus or rhinovirus. And so in product development, this is what my job has been in corporate for 30 years, is working with the marketing department to determine what claims we need to make on the product we want to sell, and then figure out the chemistry that we need to do it, and then develop the product and verify that it works. So we have our structure, and this is our marketing targets that we would develop. Now, why is all this important? Well, on the left over here, the naked virus. It's got this brown little dots around there. No, that's like a shell of protein. It's really, really tough. Really, really tough. And so that is a small naked virus. On the right side, you still see that brown hexagon in the middle of it, but it is surrounded by an orange area with the little blue dots on the outside. Those little blue dots on the outside are the spikes on the outside of the shell. And if you've seen the pictures of the coronavirus, it has spikes on the outside. So that is a diagrammatic uh, example of what a coronavirus might look like uh, if we did a cross section of it. And if we want to destroy the envelope around it, we use something that just solubilizes the envelope. We just solubilize the envelope and it gets wiped out. And if it doesn't have those little blue dots around it, it cannot attach to the cell. It's just that simple. So we make a formulation, put it in the lab, test it, destroy the envelope around it. And now we make a naked virus and suddenly coronavirus will not cause disease. Right. That's the theory behind viral control with coronavirus. Develop something that either hits the heart of it, or it destroys the outside shell. So let's talk about coronavirus. All right. The disease that we're currently encountering is called SARS-CoV-2. That is the proper scientific name for it. And you can see where it comes from. It's severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. Uh, Virologists are not quite as clever as some of us bacteriologists. Uh, we have a little bit more clever name we come up with, uh, genus and species name, but they have a different naming convention uh, in virology. So they named it this way. All right, what's SARS-1? Well, SARS-1 was about 15 years ago, and that was the one that we really thought was going to cause a global pandemic in the same category because it's a coronavirus also, but World Health Authority and, uh, decided that this one's going to be called SARS-CoV-2. What's COVID-19? That's actually the name of the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. And all right, it's a member of the coronavirus. Uh, all of us have had other coronaviruses. They are the one of two viruses that cause common colds. There are many, many, many many other coronaviruses in nature. Um, it is an envelope virus. One thing I'm going to say at this point, this there was internet trolls going around and started saying at the beginning of this that this was an engineered virus that was made in a laboratory in Wuhan. Those are internet trolls that have absolutely no basis in scientific fact stating things like that. 
it is relatively well known by anybody in the microbiology world. That's credible. This was probably a wild virus. We've seen viruses like this. Go back and look at those first couple slides. This is a natural virus that crossed the animal barrier and jumped into the human population. Okay, so how long is this virus going to hang around? Well, there was a study that came out in, um, I don't know, late March, early April. I can't remember exactly when the study came out. So they studied how long the viral particles would survive on various services. And they published two different ones. And, you know, and the full references on it, if you were fascinating reading, I suggested I put you to sleep in a heartbeat. Um, all right, what we want to look at is the three log reduction rate. Well, they didn't study how long the aerosols would survive. And we talked about sanitizers doing a 99.9% .9 reduction because if you can do a 99.9%, .9%, which is the same as three logs, you've reduced the infection level to where you're not likely to catch the disease. Well, they didn't study aerosols, but they did study copper. And so if you put viral particles on an untreated, cleaned copper surface, the viral particles will lose infectivity in less than four hours. So if you want a self sanitizing surface, in your float center, build everything out of copper. Yeah, just try to keep that clean and keep that from oxidizing when you're dealing with 30% mag sulfate. Yeah, right, not gonna work. Okay, good try. All right, but cardboard, the virus lasted 24 hours on cardboard in a drop of a low. That's where the story came from. If you got a box from Amazon, just set the box aside for 24 hours and the viruses will inactivate naturally. And that's where that came from is this particular study. On stainless steel, the viruses are viable for 48 hours. On plastic, they're viable for 72 hours. What's it mean? The longer viruses are on surfaces and viable, the more likely it is that you're going to be able to pick them up. But these were studies that were done under controlled laboratory conditions, typically between 40 and 60% of relative humidity at about 25 degrees centigrade, warm room temperature. What's the relative humidity inside of a float room? Is it between 40 and 60%? Or is it a little bit higher? Is the temperature a little bit warmer? It is likely that the vital time viability retention of the virus particles inside of a float room will be longer than what you see out here. Does that really mean anything? Hey Roy, it's Ashkan. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. We're losing a little bit of your uh, audio. If you maybe like get a little closer to the computer or, or speak a little louder, I think we'll, we'll be able to hear okay. you better. How's that? Yeah, that's that a little great. bit better? That's perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Doug Dodgers. Okay. So what's that mean? What that means is that this is a respiratory virus. And to get it, you've got to get it from the surface into the respiratory lining of the nose, or even deeper into that. And so if you are touching surfaces, and then you are touching your face, you are likely to spread it. But current studies indicate that perhaps less than 5% of the infections are spread this way. So that means surfaces inside of a float room or inside of a float center or in the lobby are not likely to be the primary sources of infection. So we're gonna talk about disinfection in there, but disinfectants and how you disinfect are not the critical factor for the control of this virus. All right, so let's talk about disinfectants. All right, there's a variety of disinfectants you can use. Um, different kinds of alcohol, ethanol, um, isopropanol. You can use quaternium ammonium compounds. And if you look at the, the, white, uh, the wipes, the Clorox and Lysol wipes that we used to get or the spray bottles, you look at the label on there and it'll say some big fancy word like alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. And we shorten that down in the industry down to AVAX, and now uh, we just call them quads. And so these are the, the traditional wipes that we used around our kitchens um, and our bathrooms area in there. 
Then you've got sodium hypochlorite bleach. But how old is the bleach? Bleach decays. If you've got a bottle of bleach that's sitting around more than 60 days, it may have as little as half of the concentration than you thought it does. So don't use old bleach. And then you've got hydrogen peroxide. These are the big four that we could be used readily to disinfect. These are the chemical agents. We'll get into the physical agents in just a minute. But let's measure how fast we can kill these things. And we use these values called CT values in there. And it's a, a constant. If you've been through a CPO class, you've seen this before. And the two factors that determine how fast you kill something are really the concentration and the time. And so you can either increase the concentration or you can increase the time. So if you want to use a faster kill of bleach, you can make a stronger solution of bleach. But if you're using something that's ready to use, like a spray bottle, you can't make it more concentrated. You use more time. So these are the two variables that you can use is concentration and time, depending on the type of products that you've got. All right. What does the literature say about these four agents? Well, if you use 78 to 95% ethanol, you get a three log reduction in 30 seconds. That is darn good. If you use isopropanol, 2-propanol, between 70 and 100%, 30 seconds. If you use quats, those are the sprays and those are the wipes, 0.2%, it takes 10 minutes. Sodium hypochlorite, bleach solution. That's a very dilute bleach solution. Normally, the bleach we buy is about 5%, sometimes as much as 8.25%. So you've got to dilute the bleach down to get this. But bleach is very effective. And hydrogen peroxide, a lot of you are using hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide for this organism is very, very good. But this is a general summary and it may not apply to any one product. Okay, so many of the articles that the, uh, the articles that are just cited in there use mixtures that you cannot readily find. So now you're stuck using where, what you can find. How do you know you are not wasting your money or wasting your time? How do you know that? Well, this is the part that you've never seen me give before because this is a very detailed explanation of how to read an EPA label. And if you think this section is exciting, you need to get another life because this is very detailed, but this is information that almost nobody outside the manufacturers knows how to do. All right, here's two products that are readily pulled off the grocery store uh, probably months ago before they got hard to find. I anticipated this outbreak getting bad late week of April, late, last week of February, first week of March. So I started stocking up on this material on here. So I'm set here at home. But if we look at that, uh, you've got the, the front label on the left and you've got the back labels on the, uh, on the right side. And if you look in there, that Lysol, it says on there, if you get real close to your screen, it says kills 99% of viruses and bacteria. And then you look at that Clorox label, it says kills 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria. But if you look carefully at that yellow label, just underneath that 45% kills germs for a deep clean. There's two asterisks. Anytime you see an asterisk on a label, you better start reading pretty quick because there are provisos that may not be exactly what you think they are. But let's take a closer look. Now we're gonna do something that's really, 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 really radical. Okay, I mean, we're going to read the direction for use. How many of you have ever read carefully 
the direction is for use on some of the disinfectants in your shop. From my experience in the pool and spa industry, maybe 5%. Okay, so the general claims are on the front. More detailed claims are on the back. And if you look at that top section up there, cuts tough grease, deodorizes, removes soap scum, kills 99.9% .9 of germs. There's the asterisk. And just below that orange and just above the directions for use, it says, kill salmonella, enterica, E. coli, 0157H7, Pseudomonas originosa, Staphylococcus aureus, avian influenza, H1N1, herpes simplex type 1, 2, 3, on hard, non-porous surfaces in two minutes. Didn't say a word about coronavirus, did it? Well, will this kill coronavirus? There is a way to look it up, and that's what we're going to go through. But the directions, we're going to go back through the entire label before we get to that in here. It's the directions for use. It tells you exactly how to use it. It has precautionary statements. Do not mix with bleach. Do not mix with an oxidizer. Store in a, uh, uh, a cool place. Read those directions. They are critical for storage. First aid treatment. It tells you what to do if somebody drinks the material. Storage and disposal. And right down there in that regulatory section, if you get real close to your screen, you're going to see these little magic words down there. The second, the third line from the bottom, it says EPA REG period NO colon 777-66. Real exciting reading, except that gives you more information than you could possibly ever imagine. I am a professional data miner of other people's products. I can find out more from that information right there than they really want to give away. And um, this is where we get into telling the personal stories about legal corporate espionage and how we pull it off against other companies. Okay, prior to getting a registration, you've got to do a whole bunch of testing. You got to do animal testing. Yes, we are required to do animal testing in the United States. We're moving away from it. It'll be another five to 10 years before we're moving away from it. But these products are tested on a limited number of animals. You have to do efficacy testing. And efficacy testing requires against target germs. You can either do this in-house or you can contract it out through what's known as a contract research organization. I've done it both ways. For the last five years, prior to June 11th, I will say that, my job was to run these contracts at other organizations. So I was the one that signed all the contracts. I was the sponsor in every bit of communication from those brands went across my desk. I helped develop the protocols and monitor the studies. Every communication was in my files archived for the next hundred years. Testing records have to be in very, very, very thorough. Not only the labs, but the sponsors like mine had to be an independent QA. Every record from that lab is submitted to the US EPA. It is very thorough. And if you want to put on the product label, marketers, kills coronavirus, you have to specify exactly the words you want on it. If you want to say best product ever made, you have to ask permission from the US EPA to do it. I've spent 30 years arguing with marketing departments saying the EPA will never, ever, ever, ever let you say that say it this way. My record of getting products through the EPA is about 100%. Uh, I've had to go back and fight a lot of terminology that somebody in marketing department wanted to make. I'm about a third successful getting that because a lot of claims that you want to make in marketing are not supportable for the science that you have to do. Okay, so after you have done all this, you've made your product, you've done all your studies, then you submit it to the EPA. 
and then you wait for 14 days to find out whether they're even going to read the package. And after that, they have five months to give you an opinion. You are now 18 months into a product. And if you're making a very, 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 very simple bathroom cleaner or a cleaner that would clean the tile line in a float tank, the toxicology and regulatory studies for, say, four bacteria are going to cost you $100,000. If you want to go back and add a fifth bacteria, that's going to cost you another $10,000 later. So you make all your claims up front and you do this. You are 18 months out from the day you start. Then you have to go through state registrations. It is a very long, complicated process that involves more paperwork than you could possibly ever imagine. So what kind of tests do you have to do? Well, they're specified in the Code of Federal Regulations. And if you want to make a hard surface disinfectant, you follow this guideline here on the left. It is called 810-2200. If you want to make a sanitizer, you follow 810-2300. Now, you don't have to follow these things exactly. Of course, then the US EPA doesn't have to give you what you want. In other words, you follow them precisely. And if you have any issues, you negotiate with the EPA before you ever start, or you get nothing after you've already spent 100,000 or in some cases, three or $400,000. Trust me on this. I have been down this road about 30 times. Now, this is all leading up to something very important. How you know whether a product works. All right, there is a thing called emerging pathogens list. This is what we're in right now. The protocols that we develop in microbiology for the germs that we know today. But germs pop up like SARS-CoV-2. And if we decide that it is a public health emergency and the CDC and the EPA have a conversation on that, then they say, this is a public health emergency. And they say, what information do we have on our current products that would allow us to use our current products and feel confident that we can kill this new or control this new organism? So they use an emergency authorization under the emerging pathogen and say, down here in the middle, and say, if product X, you've already got data on it, and it kills E. coli 0110. And suddenly, E. coli 0157 popped up. The EPA would say, well, if you kill this E. coli, you're likely to be able to kill this E. coli. So they're going to say, yes, okay, under emergency authorization, we're going to let you claim that organism. But if you were killing E. coli, and suddenly we decided Pseudomonas was the baddest guy on the block, the EPA would say, hell no, you're not going to get that one. You've got to go test it. All right, so what, what do we know about coronavirus? Well, we know that there are four primary coronaviruses. They are that really down there, real exciting names that virology likes to use, like 229E, NL63, OC43, HKU1. So a lot of products have already been tested against one of these coronaviruses. So if a product has already been shown to test against one of these, it's going to be automatically under this granted permission to kill SARS-CoV-2 under the emerging pathogens list or if it has been shown to kill something more resistant than coronavirus, like a small uh, non-envelope virus, it's going to get under emergency authorization. There were internet trolls in the spring when Lysol came out and said, we can kill coronavirus. And the internet trolls said, hey, Lysol already had this on their label. Therefore, we believe that coronavirus was a man-made virus and it was released to the population so that people could sell more products. I have two words to say to that, and I want to be very careful about the words that I select. 
bullshit. Lysol had tested the products. Clorox had tested the products on human coronavirus for decades. We knew about human coronaviruses, but when the emerging pathogens list came out, they used a process which was well established for 15 or 20 years at the EPA, and people were granted emergency authorization. And that emergency authorization is called list in. And if you want to look it up, there's the link right on the screen. And there are PDF of these slides attached to the uh, this particular workshop. So you can get back into Pathable. You can load this whole thing down there. And you can have all the references and you can use this as a tool to look up anything. So you can look up what has been approved using list in. It's all public information. There is nothing being hidden here whatsoever. There is no hidden agenda. This is public information. And so you can, there are hundreds of products on here. You can look up by the EPA registration number, the name, the product name, the company. You can look it up. But it doesn't give you details of the product. So that is why the most important thing that I'm going to show you is the next part. And that is exactly how to use that information. And on that label, you have to be able to identify who marketed. You have to have the, the EPA registration number. You have to have where the plant it was produced. And if you're doing market intelligence, that label gives you. And when you look at that EPA registration number, the top bullet point under there usually says something like US EPA reg number, and it will be some number, either a three digit or a four digit number followed by a hyphen, usually by a three-digit or a four-digit number. That tells you everything you need to know. If you find a AABCC, that means they copied a formula under license and have bought the rights to use it. So they didn't make the product, it's a sub-registration. And the A's are the company number, the B's are the product number, and the C's are the sub-registrations. This information tells you huge quantities of information. All right, why is this important? Well, if you put on your product, you kill coronavirus, that is a claim. And if you're claiming something, you must have a registered product, but it costs money and time. Not every company is honest. And a lot of companies make implied claims. And they're making implied claims and they're saying, control this or control that. And they're using wiggle words. If you are looking at a product and you cannot immediately find a US EPA registration number and a common or an equivalent number in your particular country, stop right there. You don't know what the product does. Right now, there's hundreds of products that are under suspicion in the United States because they're making bogus claims. And if you find in the United States, if you find a product that says kills or control biofilm, run. Currently, I believe there is one product and you will never see it in this industry used in the dental industry. If you see the word biofilm used on any product in the United States, you could almost guarantee, I'd say 99.99999, eight nines, that that is a bogus product. Okay, so now you know how to look up the numbers. Well, you know where to get the numbers. Now we're gonna use that number and we're gonna use a product called the National Pesticide Information Retrieval System, which is run by the Purdue University under contract to the EPA. And it's gonna, you're gonna be able to find everything you ever wanted to know on this product. Use this, and you're gonna look up the master label. Now the master label is this really broad label. A Clorox label for bleach, maybe 50 pages long. It's gonna have how to disinfect eggs, how to treat a water well, how to disinfect laundry, how to disinfect a swimming pool. So it's gonna have multiple uses. So you're not gonna get a 50 page label on a bottle of bleach, you're gonna get what's called a market label. 
because it's consumer friendly. And so you're going to be able to look up that product and get the master label. And every time a company wants to change a claim, they have to go back to the EPA. And I mean every time. Now, some changes are minor you can get away with. Many changes are major. But how do we use NPEARS and all the information we got? I warned you this was not the most exciting presentation. Trust me, it does get better. All right. When you use NPEARS, it pops up like this. If you're going to get a page like this, this is a screenshot directly off uh, it took like Wednesday or something like that. This is the NPEARS page. You can look up that EPA registration number. You type that number right off the bottle, right in that box, and you hit the word. You type it in there. There's a little box down there that says search. You hit search, and that pops up. This product, this product made by the Clorox company, there's the mailing address. The date approval on that is August 28, 2002. That was the original approval date. There's the product manager at the EPA. That is his phone number. All right. And then there's the percent active, and there's that alkyl dimethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. So now you know what that is. Doesn't tell you a whole lot, right? Now you got to get the master label. Click on that little EPA symbol up there. This page pops up. You want the most current label, May 29th, 2020. It's the most current label this product has got. There is the label. That is the official letter from the US EPA. And it's really exciting reading in there. It says something like um, that last sentence is like, the antimicrobials division has conducted a review of this request for its applicability under PRN 9810 and finds the action requested falls within the scope. Um, in other words, the EPA gave them what they wanted. But it took a month to get it. You scroll down a little bit, there's the, actually the master label. The product name is actually Clorox Everest. But on the bottle that I bought at Kroger, it said Clorox Centiva, multi-surface cleaner. So the market label is different than the master label. Um, for the last five years when I was at Biolab, in the household division, we made, oh, I don't know, a half a dozen different formulas of bleach, a couple of different household disinfectants in here. And you never want to really give away your product name, what you're really doing. So for the last few years, we um, used superheroes from the Marvel Universe. And so all the products were named after minor superheroes of the Marvel Universe. Because we had a guy that was an expert on it. And so we'd go to him and say, hey, we need a product that's doing this. And he'd go, oh, we're going to name it after this character. Or we're going to name it after that character. We're going to name it after that character. Well, you know, I worked for Biolab Kick for seven years. In here, and we were known as a fast follower uh, in the household disinfectant business. Because everything Clorox and Lysol did, we uh, knocked off of it. Because when you'd go into Walmart, and this is where the industrial espionage stories come in here, and this is how industrial espionage works. And so Walmart would go to these major manufacturers and they would say, we want a product that does this. And they would say, okay. And then Walmart would call in our buyers and say, well, we're gonna get a product that does this from Clorox or Lysol. They wouldn't tell us what Clorox and Lysol were doing, but they would tell us generally what they wanted. So we had to work in series with them. Uh, and Clorox wouldn't tell us what we're doing. Lysol wouldn't tell us. So we had to invent a product that we thought was going to be identical to theirs. Because when Clorox or Lysol puts a product on the market, right next to it on the shelf, Walmart has a generic brand. It's not made by Clorox or Lysol. It's made by a cheaper company. And that was the division that I worked with. And we had to have our product on the shelf the same day. We could tell from the background what they were doing. Usually that because of the public information system that we're showing you right now, this information is publicly accessible. If somebody files something at the EPA, 
you can kind of get your hands on it and figure out what it is. Unfortunately, one time Lysol put out a product that they didn't really figure it out. And the name of that product was Spy. It took us 18 months to come up with a product. They hit it very well. Uh, this goes on all the time. It's an industrial sabotage, industrial espionage, not sabotage, of knocking off products. Companies make millions and millions of dollars doing this. When you go through the label, you can get, it takes, this is the actual wording that you can see on the label. And if you see down here on the lower, in the middle of the right-hand column, in there just below the yellow, uh, kills certain viruses, 30 seconds, kills cold and flu viruses, kills E. coli or salmonella. There's wording in here that gives you the information that and you can read through there, and you can verify whether the claims that you're seeing are actually Im important to you. Oh, yeah. The general summary on this, and we've got about six more slides or something like that. Uh, uh, for germs with membranes, quats and alcohol are your primary choices. For non-enveloped viruses, it takes longer and higher concentrations. If you're dealing with rotavirus, not a big concern unless you've got kids coming into your float center because kids get rotavirus all the time. You need to use a more disinfectant. And if you've got kids and you go into a pediatrician's office, chances are you're gonna come home sick because they do not disinfect pediatrician's office as well as they should. If a label says kills 99.9% .9 of germs in 30 seconds, it does not mean it kills all germs in 30 seconds or all germs. You need to read the detailed label to see if the product works for you. Okay. Under directions for use, it's gonna tell you exactly how to use the product. Do you need to pre-clean the surface? Is it an all-purpose cleaner, a heavy-duty cleaner? Do you need to pre-clean the surface? If it says pre-clean the surface, pre-clean the surface. Is it a ready-to-use product? This is a question that I got last year uh, at the float conference in here. Uh, somebody hadn't read the label and they were taking a household product uh, and it was a cami and a trigger lock. So it was ready to use at the right concentration and they couldn't get enough distance out of that you know, bottle. And so they were diluting it in a bucket of water. And so now they were diluting that probably 100 to 1. That means it was 100 times, it was at 1% of the concentration it should have been at. And we talked earlier about, you know, you got to have CT concentration and time. That young gentleman was absolutely wasting his time and money. If it is a ready to use product and it comes in a trigger bottle, do not dilute it. If it is a concentrated product, it will tell you how to dilute it. All right, let's talk about dilution. If it says, for example, add one cup of product to one gallon of water, you add one cup of product to one gallon of water. You do not pour a shot in a bucket of dirty water and apply it with a rag that the dog chews on. I have seen it done. That is not the way you're going to be killing or controlling the health of your system. They are tested at very specific concentrations. It's not that difficult. Follow the directions on the label. All right, uh, I think six more slides. Uh, didn't I say that earlier? Oops. Uh, UV kills by cross -linking. That's enough about chemistry. Let's talk about physical systems because some of you I know are talking about UV systems. How do you use UV? Well. The light must shine on the germ, uh, germ to work. It must be bright enough. In other words, it must impart enough energy and it must shine on it long enough. Again, it is concentration and time. If the germ is shielded by debris or the bulb is, is surface life, 
How long did the instructions on that bulb say it's good for? Did it say it's good for 400 hours or 500 hours or 1,000 hours or 3,000 hours? If you are using it past that lifetime, you are wasting your effort. It may not be working. And what's really bad, UV systems are not nearly as regulated as pesticides. And so there are numerous products on the market, the little UV systems that you wave over your keyboard, so it's supposed to disinfect your keyboard. My suggestion, instead of putting the money into those UV systems that you wave over your keyboard, is I would save the money and go out and get a chai latte and a croissant. You will get more out of a chai latte and a croissant than those damn cheap crap pieces of crap that they wave over your keyboard. All right, transmission in a float tank. Specifically talking about SARS-CoV-2. All right, yes. About 14% of the clinical cases show gastrointestinal illnesses. That means somebody is gonna find this germ in feces. And even with a pre-float shower, some feces is gonna be introduced into the, uh, into the float tank. But there are no studies on transmission in float water. But we do have 40 years of data on pools and spots. Now in pools, fecal transmission is a major issue. 40 years of data on spas showed that there is zero documented cases of gastrointestinal wound. Zero. A float tank is in some ways similar to a hot tub. I have zero con concern about the transmission of this virus in float solution. Let me repeat that. I have zero concern about the transmission of this virus in float solution. Let's talk about masks. These are the medical grade masks. Now, the only ones that we normally run into are the N95s and the surgical masks in here. These are the two and they're very hard to get. How good are they? The N95 reduces transmission of about 95% and the surgical mask is about 80% effective. These are the best ones. And since all the N95 masks are being diverted to healthcare, we're kind of stuck at this point with the knockoff KN, uh, KN95s and the surgical masks. This is the ranking of the order. Positive air supply masks. Now we saw these in Italy, and these are the big plastic heads uh, that went over their complete head. And then they had an air supply line. Sometimes they had an oxygen tank tacked up to the back. So it was a positive pressure, and so it was pressurizing, so no germ got into their head. But if they were not wearing a mask underneath that, they were exhaling, and if they were asymptomatic carriers, they would still be spreading the germ. So they work to protect the individual, but they may not protect the person next to them. So that means for general purposes, the gold standards are the N95s. And the KN95 is a Chinese version without a vent, we're gonna to get to the vent issues in just a minute, assuming that you've got a quality version of KN95. I predicted this was gonna happen. I ordered mine in late February. Even at that point, it took about three weeks to get them. So I have about 100 KN95 masks on hand right now. All right, the next best mask you'd have is a surgical mask. Below that is the multi-layered cloth mask, preferably three layers. Below that's the single layers, the bandanas. Below that's the neck gaiters. Anything below that red line has limited effectiveness. So if you are using a bandana or a neck gaiter, you're probably doing nothing. As a general rule, if that mask is leaking, it has reduced effectiveness. If you are wearing a mask and you're wearing glasses and your glasses are fogging, your mask isn't fitting right. If you are wearing a mask with a vent, it lets you exhale, but it also means if you are a carrier and you're exhaling, you are exhaling infected particles. So in a mask with a vent protects you, 
but it increases the exposure of people around you. And the virus won't grow on the mask, but it will remain infected for a couple of days. And if it starts turning a little bit funny color, it's probably because you've got a little bit of mucus and bacteria growing on the mask. They're designed to be a limited use mask. All right, uh, I'm gonna switch gears for just a minute. Uh, I also happen to be sitting on the Float Tank Association, and we're developing a database that has a bunch of this information that will be available to you. We're still developing it. Uh, I'm a little bit behind on getting some of this done. It has something to do with changing careers about June the 11th and suddenly running an entire field program on pool. Uh, yeah, so it's like I'm a little bit behind, but through the Float Collective and through the FTA, you're going to hear a lot more information. And, and my goal uh, is to try to make that uh, this website a clearinghouse where we can all get our information back and forth. All right, a couple of points. Germs are everywhere, including in you and on you. There's almost no environments without germs. Your health depends on having the right kinds of germs. And when we create artificial environments such as float tanks, our health depends on managing the interactions of the germs, the environment, and your own interactions. We manage. Here's my thoughts on the float tanks. An infected but asymptomatic person using the float tank, the air is likely to harbor infectious droplets. The virus may linger in the air for a number of minutes. 15, 20 minutes, somewhere in that range. Because of the humidity, the particles will be large and they will drop out. The surfaces may harbor infectious virus, but the risk to the next person is very small. If the staff is wearing a suitable mask while cleaning and wearing the mask properly, the risk to the staff is small. Overall, the risk to the general floating population is small but there are populations we need to make special precautions for. Anybody over 60, really if they're over 70, and really if they're over 80, if they are immunocompromised, if they are currently going through chemo or radiation therapy, if they have pre-existing medical conditions, HIV, if they are smokers, if they're diabetic, if they have heart disease, if they have blood pressure, they are at increased risk. And this is an individual decision as to whether or not they should be floating, but the general population is relatively at low risk for a floating environment. I think this is the last slide. Life is a series, continuous series of risks, picking a spouse driving a car while there are other people on the same road, starting and running a business, eating strawberries from a grocery store. Yes, I do all of these things. These are risks that we accept. This virus will be with us for many more months or more likely years. That is the latest news we do not expect to get back fully into a fully recovered situation, probably until the first quarter of 2022. We're likely to start getting vaccines that are widely acceptable around the 1st of April next year. It will take months to develop a population. Remember we talked about being able to cut off the food supply? The way you cut off the food supply for this virus is called herd immunity. That requires vaccinations and pre-exposure. Those are the two ways we're going to limit this vaccine. We're going to limit this virus. Our knowledge and transmission prevention is increasing rapidly. The end of this pandemic depends on two different inputs. The natural evolution of the virus and how we ap uh, apply our knowledge. This is what we can control. How we respond or whether we respond at all. There 
are all of the uh, information on here. And that was the end of my presentation. Thank you.